Today is the feast of St. Charles Borromeo. He's a very pertinent saint for what's been going on recently. Uh, we see that Bergoglio traveled to Scandinavia to uh, partake in the, the, the beginning of the, the quote-unquote Jubilee for the refer anniversary of the Reformation of Martin Luther. And he's taking part in it, and it's such a great thing, you know, that um, he's up there praising the faith of the, of the, of the people of that religion, of the, the Protestant religions. He's praising Martin Luther, and, and he's, you know, and he's doing this big ecumenical bow and committing great sins against the faith, great blasphemies and, and uh, against the faith by, you know, praising this Protestant Reformation. And what he's doing is praising a man who really and truly uh, destroyed the faith for millions of people because he himself had no virtue of faith whatsoever. The virtue of faith, of course, is not to say that someone you know, might believe in Jesus Christ or someone might believe in certain aspects of the faith, but to have the virtue of of faith means that someone not only intellectually knows the, the truths of the Catholic faith, but believes them in their heart as well. That is the virtue of faith. And of course, someone who fights against the faith cannot have the virtue of faith. And Martin Luther committed grave errors against the faith, getting rid of you know most of the sacraments, all but two of the sacraments, and uh, ensuring that uh, that all of the tradition of the church was gone, that he uh, made sure that uh, it was personal interpretation of the scriptures and, the, and, that, um, and that scripture alone was, was the only basis of, of truths and also that, uh, you know, that, uh, that in that, uh, uh, that only faith was necessary for salvation, not faith and works combined. How can, I mean, it doesn't even follow to make sense that you could, have faith and not follow through with works, but he managed to, to somehow believe that. So, anyways, Luther, and there were many, many other grave errors that followed with him, that was a destruction of the faith and a tearing away of the faith for many, many people, not only at that time, but also all the way down to today's time. Well, St. Charles Borromeo is the perfect example of how to do it. Luther is the example of how not to go about incorporating productive change when there was need of change in the church. There were certain areas that things could be changed. There were abuses going on uh, throughout the, the, the church uh, by some of the men there. But Martin Luther attacked the aspects of the faith. St. Charles Borromeo enacted change that was productive inside the church. Uh, not only uh, keeping, but f flourishing the truths of the faith. So Charles Carmel was born in the 1500s, and at a young age, he actually became one of the subjects of something that was really actually going wrong at that time. His uncle had uh, become the Pope and had appointed him at a young age of 22 to be a cardinal in Rome. Uh, he had been going through seminary training up to that point, uh, but he was only 22 years old and already being made a cardinal there and given a great uh, extensive, what we call benefits, a large sum of money coming from one of the monasteries for doing certain favors to go along with it. But St. Charles Borromeo took that and while he knew that he had responsibility as a cardinal, he took it very seriously and he performed those duties as faithfully as he could. And then as for his benefits, he took only what needed to operate the church that he was at and all the rest of that money he gave to the poor, exercising true piety and ensuring that he himself wasn't corrupted by wealth. Then he was, the, he was to be part of the Council of Trent that was going on. The Council of Trent, of course, was called for the very purpose of fighting against the Protestant Reformation, fighting against 
that uh, those errors being spread throughout the world. And he took great part in that third session of the council in laying down uh, truths there for the faith. And also, he took a, to a great extent care to, be, to partake in that writing of the catechism of the Council of Trent. Something that wasn't just, you know, so the documents were for the, the clergy, really, but that catechism that came out of there was to ensure that not only did the clergy know the faith and what was to be expected in regards to the Catholic Church, but we want all people to be able to un read and be able to understand that and to be taught that in, in you know, catechism classes, things like that. And so the, the, the Council of Trent put out a catechism for the people. And he, to a large extent, participated in the very writing of that catechism and to instruct the people in the truths of the faith, something that most of which are very easily demonstrable, just it takes the time to do so. Then he wasn't satisfied there. You know, he's also it was made uh, in the near future was made Archbishop of Milan. And he not only in Rome, but also in Milan, especially because that being his new archdiocese, um, he took great care to enact changes for the clergy because that was a, a, an area where a lot of that rot came from. You have to remember, Martin Luther himself was a priest, but those priests were very uneducated. They were very poorly trained. They were allowed to live lives of great wealth, searching either after great wealth and riches, or living debauched lives, or falling into grave errors against the faith, because they were just ignorant, largely speaking, and allowed to their own devices. And so he enforced that all of the, the, the curia of Rome were, were to wear black, and that he was, that everybody now had to go through a proper seminary training and laid out many of the courses that still stay to us today that have to be followed in the, the, the education of young men for the priesthood. And he ensured as well that all of those abuses were to go aside, these great huge benefices, benefices these great sources of wealth were to be tempered back. And that, that the great groups of uh, of monasteries for prayer were set up there in the archdiocese, and he made sure that, that there are all sorts of different spiritual aspects to it, to bring man back from, from the, these men, these priests, back out from, if you would, the spiritual cold, and into the light of the faith, into that heart of the love of God, by themselves practicing those aspects of love, those religious aspects. And, and he enacted all of this, he did all of this, and eventually, you know, turned to Milan, most especially, but also helped in other areas of the world, into great, take it from areas where very few really harbored true devotion to the faith, to an area that was such a great stronghold for the faith, and the people were able to exercise so much and grow in love and service of God. And it didn't take destroying any aspect of the divine teachings of Christ himself. It all had to do with just correcting the abuses and the, and the follies of men at that time, and to bring it under good, solid leadership. He did all this and died at the young age of 48 years old, and that but he did so much that he became such a great saint, a saint that most especially in these times where again when we see so many people falling away from the practice of the true faith, a great saint to ask for intercession for us, that we continue to harbor all of the truths of the, of the faith and do all that we can to reform ourselves first and those around us when possible by first our prayers and also our good example, and at times our words. So, pray to St. Charles Borromeo, especially in this time, and especially as we come up to that 500-year anniversary mark of the, the, the Reformation, a source of great scandal to souls that brought so many people away from the true faith and away from that ark of salvation. May God bless you, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.